for those of us here on the East Coast, good morning still to those in Central Mountain and West Coast time. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here today. Um, as I'm sure you already know, um, we're going to be talking about incorporating air tools into your agricultural toolbox. But before we get started, let's go over some housekeeping things here. Um, number one, of course, is this webinar is going to be worth one ISA CEU, which is great. Now, if you did not put in your certification number during the registration process, you can do so now. If you see over there on the right-hand side of your screen, probably someplace over in this area, you'll see a uh, maybe a little arrow. If you click on that arrow, that will expand out the uh, GoToMeeting box, and you will see something that says questions. If you click in that area, you can put in your certification number right now, and that way we'll be sure to get you signed up for your CEU for attending this uh, webinar this morning. So again, look forward to that. Uh, again, this webinar is being recorded. This will be available afterwards. We'll send you an email with that information. I should probably mute my phone. We'll send you an email with that information, um, as well as we've recorded a series of other webinars that we've done throughout this year as well. So you can go to our website anytime, treecarescience.com, to find those. So who is this person speaking to you uh, in your computer today? My name is Patrick Anderson, and I'm an arborologist with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancement. So my role is to provide training and technical support for both our remote staff that we have stationed throughout the country as well as our clients. So part of my job is to um, go out and work in the field and make sure that uh, our clients are comfortable with um, diagnosis and treatment and protocols around plant health care and tree management. So you can see my information there. You can feel free to call me at any time, contact me at any time. We also have this handy technical support number right now. Um, which you can call again at any time, and you'll get an actual human being on the other side of that phone. And if that person can't answer your question, and if that person can't um, can't find somebody right away to answer your question, then I tell people that by the end of the day, we'll have at least some answer for you. So again, if you have a question about ordering products, protocols, dosing, anything like that, feel free to call that number at any time. So real quick, a quick... Um, to put things into perspective while we're here today, who is Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements? Well, you can see this timeline here. We've, we've accomplished a lot over the years. We were started in 1977 by a fellow by the name of Tom Prosser, and he went around um, the, the Twin Cities area up there in Minnesota, so it would be Minneapolis, St. Paul area, and he did preventative Dutch elm disease uh, tree injections. Well, that, that, um, that business grew, and uh, his clients started asking for more services. So about not more than 10 years later, the full Rainbow Tree Care was born. And so Rainbow Tree Care is now the largest tree care provider, full-service tree care provider, in the, again, the Minneapolis, um, St. Paul area of Minnesota. And so there's great advantage to being tied to a full-care tree company and that is basically is when we bring products, equipment and protocols to you, the professionals out there, the rest of the country, well they've all been tested through our service department so we can really give you predictable results with again our equipment and protocols. In 1998 the scientific advancements part of the company was born and that's who who, who I work for, and this is the product side of the company. So what we do is we develop plant health care products and protocols, and we bring that to you, the practitioner, so that you and you can go and manage trees on your clients' properties um, effectively and, again, with predictable results. And that's really what our mission is, is to, is to bring predicted, predictable results to the industry. Over our years, we have participated in a lot of research um, to highlight some of that research, one would be we helped develop the oak wilt management protocol with the USDA. Uh, our research, along with some others, helped us to bring higher rates of imidacloprid, uh, specifically our Zytex product, so that we could get more predictable results while treating for uh, emerald ash borer. And again, we, in, in 2014, we introduced a full line of tree injection equipment, um, again, a way to put products into trees very effectively and fastly 
so that we can protect a lot of trees against some of these really harmful plant damaging pests. And what I like to tell people is that we, a, a large part of our budget goes into research and development specifically around tree and landscape pests. So every product you purchase from Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements, part of that profit goes directly into research and development. And we were in a meeting just uh, last week and we have close to 70 research projects going on this year that all revolve around improving protocols around the pests and diseases that we're managing on our trees every day. So again, when you purchase from Rainbow product, you can feel safe in knowing that part of that is going right back into doing research and development in the field that we are all working in. So with that though, what are we here for today? And that is to talk about air tools. So our intended outcomes for our conversation today, which should last about an hour, uh, we're going to be talking about the key features of air tools. Um, we're going to be talking about the key tree healthcare uses and protocols around the air spades specifically. We're going to try to talk about ways that you can bring this into your already your, your list of services that you're already offering to your clients and the way this can complement a lot of these and, and of course add on to the list of services that you're already adding to your clients. And then we'll talk about opportunities beyond um, specific um, soil and root health issues. Things that you can also use an airspace for once that you have that in your plant healthcare toolbox arsenal. So with that, let's get started and let's answer the very first question is, what is an air tool and what is an air spade? Well, simply stated, this is a tool where we utilize compressed air, we push it through a tube, and we can use it to move soil using compressed air, move soil away from sensitive underground objects, specifically in our case, roots. Um, this was developed, this is used in the military to uh, search for landmines and uncover landmines. Uh, it's used in industrial uses for, again, digging out and finding um, things like fiber optic lines. Um, but again, all these things are very sensitive and of course tree roots are sensitive. So we could take this same technology and apply it to our profession, which would be trying to improve root health. This really emerged in the late 1990s as a tool for arborists. And because of that, um, they have developed a kind of all-inclusive, what they call arborist kit. And with this arborist kit, you get one, of course, you get the handle. So this would be the Air Spade 2000, Air Spade 2000 handle. This handle is very neat because it has a, it has what they call a dead man trigger. So if you were to let go of this trigger, it's going to cut off air circulation very fast. So again, if you trip. If uh, something surprises you and you drop the air space, it's not going to continue to push compressed air out. It'll cut off that flow of, of air. The other thing that comes in our arborist kit is this, this four-foot barrel, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, secondly, what we'll get is our, our nozzle. And we'll talk about these nozzles here. The nozzle really is the key to the air space. So we'll get a nozzle that is either set to 150 or 225 cubic feet per minute, and we'll talk about that in a little while here as well. You get a 10-foot lightweight air hose, as seen there, and finally you get this neat little case to carry around the air spade. Um, it's very durable and uh, protects the, the parts in the air spade very, very well. So again, to start diving into how the air spade works, we know that it uses compressed air to push soil out of the way, and it, it uses, the, to get that air in the machine, what we're going to be using is something like this toe-behind air compressor. And the size of our air compressor is going to be tied to the size of nozzle at the end of the air spade that we're going to use. And again, we said that you can specify whether you want the 150 cubic feet per minute nozzle or the 225 cubic feet per minute nozzle. So depending upon your nozzle size is going to be is going to depend upon the type of air compressor that you get. If you look at this air compressor, if you've ever driven around during the summertime and have seen road work going on, these are the same types of air compressors that they hook jackhammers up to. Because jackhammers are powered by compressed uh, air, so it's the same type of air compressor that is used um, for jackhammers. And again, the Chicago-style coupling is what I like to call a jackhammer hose. So you would attach your air spade very similarly as you would attach a jackhammer to this uh, with your jackhammer hose with your coupling. And again, you would want to set your air compressor 
to 90 PSI, which again, you would set that air at the air compressor, and then the air compressor would need to be able to, to power itself and push it 150 to 225 cubic feet per minute. Um, these air compressors you can rent very easily from many um, rental places throughout our country. Um, and I'd leave it up to you as to which rental place you prefer. But um, they usually run anywhere between $150 to $250 per day. So again, when we start talking about pricing um, services with the Airspade, you can build that into your price. Um, and eventually, of course, if you build a, uh, a big enough market for it, you could purchase your own, which many companies have done. So really the special thing about the airspace, so I'm sure as arborists we're very, you know, we like to see things, we like to tinker, and, and some of us like to build things ourselves. So if we're looking in an airspace, we can see, so you're telling me you're hooking a hose that I can get purchased from my rental place or from wherever, hook it up to a metal cylinder and blow air out of it. So, you know, can't I build that myself? Well, yeah, you could, but it's the nozzle in the airspace, and the nozzle, of course, is patented, the nozzle is what, the air, is what makes the airspace so special. And it's really the, the shape of the nozzle directs air out of the, the cylinder. And this is where we get our, our power from. And this is where we're getting air actually traveling at two times the speed of sound. Or because of the, the, the shape and direction of our nozzle, approximately 2,250 feet per second. So the air is moving out of there very, very fast. It's very directed. And you can see, depending upon the size of your air compressor, uh, and again, what you're utilizing your air spray for, you can have different size nozzles. Some that go up to over 300 cubic feet per minute, which you would want to use if you were really getting into the utility business and, and digging lines um, with your air spray versus through traditional methods. But again, to take a closer look at this nozzle, it's this focused air, and this is why it is so efficient at moving soil around also penetrating soil and expanding soil um, around is when we have just a, a simple cylinder here, we have airflow that once it comes out, it goes in every single direction. So while that air is still coming out at pretty fast rates, it can certainly move some soil around, don't get me wrong, it will certainly move soil at an undirected um, nozzle here, but with our directed airflow, we're going to maximize, capture a lot of that compressed air, and we're going to push it um, right into the soil so that we can move soil, also expand soil. And that's really where, where our use comes in uh, from a tree healthcare uh, perspective, is that this is a way to expand pore space within the soil through non-mechanical means, which is a great thing because if we have done anything like this in the past, um, you know, to improve soil, we had to disturb a lot of roots through mechanical means, either through tillers or through trenchers. So now we have a non-invasive system that puts compressed air into the soil, which moves soil as well as expands soil. And this is where we'll start talking here in a little while about um, you know, the uses and why expanding soils um, can be important and protocols around that. But to kind of tie this into some real life, um, real life protocols and real life stories here, so our, again, I mentioned we have a full service tree care company um, in the, the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. And the original reason why our company purchased an air spade was primarily to, to do root collar excavations. So if we can talk about why, what, you know, how we used to do root collar excavations and why we want to do root collar excavations, if anybody has ever done root collar excavation um, in the past without the use of an air tool, you know that it can take a long time. It can be very uh, strenuous, really, really stressful on yourself because you're bent over. Um, you know, we're using small hand tools. We're digging away that um, the the soil, trying to find that root flare. Uh, we're using things like hand trowels and brushes with stout bristles, and we have to be very careful because, of course, what we're trying not to do is, of course, damage that bark of the tree. So we're using rigid, hard tools to dig through the soil, but at the same time try to do as minimal damage to the tree as possible. And this used to take a long time to do um, and do a good job and not hurt the tree. But now using the air spade, which what used to take literally could take over an hour, if not more, depending upon the size of the tree and the severity of how it was buried. 
we can do in minutes just by simply directing air at the tree, around the tree, around the soil around the tree, and pushing that air, just simply pushing that air away. Um, it works very, very well. Now, of course, that air is moving at an extreme speed. Um, so, thin, so for thin bark trees, we still do need to take care. And I can tell you from experience, I have blown the bark off of white pine trees once or twice because I just simply wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. So um, take it from me, you still want to pay attention to what you're doing and uh, be cognizant of the type of tree and the thickness of the bark um, while you're using this as a way to do root collar excavations. But let's talk about why we even really, you know, why do we want to do root collar excavations? What is the purpose of that? And it's really to talk about what the root collar actually is. The root collar is the transition zone between the trunk of the tree and the root system of the tree. And that root collar, if, again, if you walk through the woods, you will notice that you have that root collar out there um, on just about every tree. And really, every size of tree, the very large trees, the very small trees, you will always see that root collar or that root flare that's going into the soil. And the, the bark on that root flare is, is very similar to trunk bark. And that bark is not adapted to be um, covered by soil or excess mulch or debris because it holds moisture up against that bark longer than, again, it's adapted to. So there's a few things happens when we cover up that part of the tree. One is, again, I just mentioned, it's, it's not adapted to have all that extra moisture on it. So that extra moisture can actually begin to break down that bark, um, in which case then that can lead to either pathogens invading the vascular system and or simply that vascular system breaking down because the bark has broken down and now the tree is responding to that um, by, again, just cutting off its vascular system in that area, which, of course, that can lead to many tree health implications. Another aspect of why we want to make sure that root collar is not buried is the tree can actually send out a secondary root system. And let me explain this for a second. So when you cover the root collar of the tree, the tree responds. The tree responds in such a way that it, it, um, it feels as though there has been some traumatic loss or damage to its overall root system. So to make up for the damage to its root system or the perceived damage to its root system, it'll begin to, to put out a secondary root system. Now, if we think about what we'll, we'll call a primary root system, our primary root system is, con, is comprised of both um, the roots, fine roots that are going to take water nutrients out of the soil, but it's also going to be comprised of our large structural roots, which, of course, we know are large structural roots are what's keeping our tree in the ground and not from falling over. Now, over time, if our secondary root system begins to flourish and take over for our primary root system, that is our secondary root system is bringing in um, an adequate amount of water and nutrients, then our primary root system will begin to die off. And now as our, our primary root system begins to die off, this is going to include our structural roots. If decay moves in the structural roots, then we have a situation where we have a tree that's high risk of failure. So we might have a tree that is perfectly green and healthy because that secondary root system is bringing in water and nutrients, but in actuality, its structural roots have decayed away, and we see something like this where we have a whole tree failure simply because at some point in time this tree's root system was covered up. Now, a final reason for root collar excavation again, has to do with the, the panic response, if you will, of the tree. So again, if we cover up that root flare, the tree responds in such a way that it feels that there has been some kind of uh, great loss or damage to its primary root system. So that secondary root system comes out. In some cases, the roots in that secondary root system will move away from the tree. In that, in that case, they will move laterally away from the tree um, the way the root system is intended to grow. But in other cases, they will move radially around the tree and form what we call a stem girdling root, which would be evidence here. And we also see this very often with trees that have not been maintained well in the nursery. That is, they've been allowed to grow in pots um, that they have outgrown, and the root system will hit that pot and will begin circling around the tree. And why this is bad specifically is what we have in this case here 
and this is quite an extreme case, is we have the trunk of the tree and our tree root, and they're simply competing for the same amount of space. And in some, time, in some cases, the trunk of the tree will win, and this, this root might either die off, break, or actually be kind of grafted in the trunk. But in other cases, the root will win. And when the root wins, what we have is we have a, a trunk, a section of the trunk, that now is having issues getting water and nutrients up into the tree, which of course can have some pretty severe effects. And again, just to put in perspective the size of that particular root, this is what that, once that root was removed, this is the size and diameter equivalent of that girdling root there. So you can see that could be a major, major problem. And again, stem girdling roots, they can mask themselves in other ways. So again, you know, this, all these, these pictures here are, are pictures of trees that were affected by stem girdling roots. So if we were to walk up to any one of these trees, we could misdiagnose these very easily as, you know, here we have a mature tree that's beginning to climb. We can diagnose that as many different ways. We have a younger tree that's showing early fall color. Um, here we have a chlorotic tree. And for some of these trees, we might be recommending fertilizer, maybe stem injections of micronutrients. But in reality, it's just simply what we, we need to do is a, a root collar excavation to remove our stem girdling roots. Now again, just a, a quick real-world example. Um, as I mentioned, the reason, the primary reason that Rainbow Tree Care in Minnesota purchased a, an air spade was for this, this process to do root collar activations and remove stem girdling roots. So now this, of course, price is just an example. You could you know, adjust this for your own market and comfortability. But on average, we will charge about 10 to $20 per inch when it comes to root collar activation and stem girdling roots. And you can see here we have a minimum site charge of about $300. And that's to make sure that we are covering all of our labor. Um, and in the past, too, what we want to do is we want to cover the, the rental fee for our air compressor, which now, of course, we own one but, or several. Um, but again, these are just ways to think about the pricing for these types of things. And while, you know, the, one of the greatest feedback, pieces of feedback that I get, of course, are um, people find it hard to talk to their clients about this service. Um, and I agree, I agree, it is part of a, an overall education campaign for your clients. But in some cases, we luck out and we see something like this, where we have very, very dramatic um, evidence that we can show, physical evidence that we can show. And this, this becomes pretty easy to, to explain to clients, where you can see an impacted root on a stem of a tree. And you know, I would bet in this case, we're definitely seeing symptoms of this girdling area um, in the crown of the tree. But another question that we get here is, is how much is too much? And we know, especially with things like maples and birch trees, we see a proliferation of stem girdling roots. So in this case, you can even see in the background here, we have roots that are girdling this tree. So we have the entire circumference of this tree is almost completely girdled. And right here on this plane, we see one, two, and it's hard to see, but there's a third girdling root all in this area. So how much is too much? Um, this is where our arborist sense really comes in and just getting an idea of the overall structure of the root system and health of the tree. But, you know, again, we always like to come up with these standards, and one very typical standard for us in our industry is not to remove either between 30 and 33 percent of any given portion of the tree at a time. So we can use that as a guideline, but of course every tree is going to be different, tree species are going to be different, and of course severity of girdling roots are going to be different. Um, another thing to, 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 another way to put this in perspective is we might, um, we might do some damage to the tree's health by removing too many roots, but we know if we leave those roots, then you know it's also, in, in a way, a, a, not necessarily a death sentence, but it's going to impact the tree's health over a longer period of time than if we were to remove some roots and allow it to go through some, some amount of stress. So if we look at this example here, there's our first large root that we removed. And you can see the size of it there. Here now there's our second large root that we removed. And we're about good here. This is where we ask ourselves again, we just removed two large roots. And this is kind of the conundrum that we fall in is that although these roots are 
girdling the tree, they are still fungal. They are still bringing water and nutrients into the crown. So that balance of how much are we, how much girdling are we going to relieve by removing large roots? How is that going to counterbalance with now the the loss in water of and nutrients that are going to be brought into the tree? And this again might be an education moment with your client. Um, and this, in this case here, you know, we're not going to be able to take off all of these roots. So we're going to need to revisit this property. And this is something that we're going to have to talk to our clients about initially um, from a sales standpoint is if we have a severe case like this, then the job is not done. We'll need to come back and relieve um, this tree of the rest of its roots at a later date. Another question is when is the best time to perform this service? And again, let's keep in mind that even though these roots are um, causing harm to the trunk of the tree and vascular system of the tree, they still are functioning as a method of getting water and nutrients up into the crown. So based upon some initial research and some articles out there, uh, probably the best time to do this service would be in the fall and or early dormant season. Um, in the summertime, we definitely run and in the summertime, especially when we're running into droughty conditions and or just reduced rainfall, hot conditions, what we'll probably want to do is we'll probably just want to let that tree live with those girdling roots and allow those roots to bring water up into the tree because this time of the year, it's probably more of a water stress issue than it is a girdling issue that's going on with our trees. So as a best management practice, fall is probably the best time to do things like remove large stem girdling roots. Now another little bonus that you can do as part of your root color excavation, of course, if you are injecting your tree with some kind of stem applied um, insecticide and or fungicide, we know that we get our best results when we are doing stem injections, doing them as low on the root flare as possible. So again, this, this is, serves two purposes. One is, of course, we clear out our root flare, which we just discussed all of the good reasons why we want to do root color excavations for that. But now we've also exposed our root flares so that we can apply our, our soil or our stem injected products um, according to our best management practices. And that would be right there low down on the, um, the root flare there. So that, that's a really nice thing. Another thing that we can start looking at now that we have an air spade, and this is something that was developed um, a few years after our original purchase of the air spade, was this process of root enhancement. We're actually using the air spade to decompact the soil around the tree and then adding um, properly organic, properly composted organic material as well as other amendments to the tree to improve overall soil health that would of course improve all over tree health. But before we go into the process of doing root enhancement, Real quick, let's just kind of take a segue here. Let's go off on a tangent on you know what trees actually get from soils, and then you know that will kind of tell us what our goals are of doing something like root enhancement. So of course we know that trees get structural support from soils again. So we send out these large structural roots, and the friction between the root and the soils which actually holds the tree up. And we know we get you know nutrients again, elemental nutrients. Most of those come directly from our soil. Water, which is key to many processes within the plant, comes directly from the soil. And then finally, all those, those roots down there, of course, are living, um, respiring cells. And all living, respiring things um, that, require, that, that don't live in anaerobic environments require oxygen. So the soil also needs to have oxygen in it so that we can have our cells um, respire and stay alive. If we look at where our root system is, now we're not talking necessarily about our structural root system, but where the, the, the roots that are gathering this water and, and getting these nutrients in the soil, where they really are, we find most often they're anywhere between that, that 6 to 9 inches, maybe as deep as 12 inches in some cases, that really, that really narrow band of soil. So that is where the tree is getting most of its water and elemental nutrients is right there on the soil, right in that, that first layer of soil. And we know, of course, that these roots can travel. They're looking for resources. So they'll go as far as they can to find these water nutrients. And you know, on average, maybe two to four times the width of the drip line. So outside of the drip line is where they're heading. Uh, and in some cases, I'm sure, even further than that, again, because they're searching for those nutrients. 
Now, if we take a look at ideal soils, and we consider like our ideal soils are our soils are forest-grown soils because most of our trees have, again, adapted to grow in a forest. And in a forest, you have something that looks like this. Is you have a very thin layer of organic matter that is slowly decaying on the forest floor. And as it decays, it's moved in through soil uh, fauna, so both micro and uh, macro organisms. That matter is, is moved in to the soil, and this is where we get our, our A layer um, of soil, our A horizon of soil. And this is a mixture of, again, mineral matter, so actually hard mineral matter, um, composted material that is, again, it's going through this process of the, the micro and macro flora and fauna breaking it down into a point where it becomes humus, which is, a, humus is really organic matter that has been compo composted as far as it could be composted. So we have a mixture of that, um, these things in this, this A horizon. Then again, if we look at this A horizon a little bit closer, our ideal A horizon is going to be, again, 45% of that is going to be that mineral material, so actually a hard mineral material. 25% um, of that is going to be air, because again, oxygen is going to be required for our roots. And then, of course, water, because, of course, our tree is going to need water. And this is going to fill up both micro and macro pore spaces. So we'll find most of our water in micro pore spaces and most of our air in these macro pore spaces um, that are important for roots to go in and colonize. And then, finally, part of that is going to be that 5% is going to be that organic material, which, again, is going to be something like a humus, something that's been broken down um, very, very far. And again, naturally, as I mentioned, in, in the woods or in the forest, we have things that are constantly dying. So we have decaying leaves, we have fallen logs, we have sticks, we have animals that, that die. Um, and these things are all decomposed and brought down into the soil. And again, as roots grow and die, they create pore space. As we have larger animals and even smaller animals crawling through the soil, they create pore space and soil structures. So this is what we get. And in the woods. But now if we compare that to our urban and suburban environment, it's a lot, lot different. So again, you know, we have a lot of issues in our urban environment with things like compaction, where we have simply, we have destroyed soil structure, which of course reduces the amount of micro and macro pore space, which reduces the amount of water that's available to plants, reduces the amount of oxygen that's available to roots, and reduces the tree's ability to even penetrate through that soil. We also have this issue here in development where when you know developers look at soil as a structural building material, and this first layer of soil, this decaying organic matter, this is not good. This is not a sound building structure. So a lot of this is removed in the course of construction. And this is a good thing because we don't want our houses to fall down, of course. But from a, from a plant point of view, this is about one of the worst things we can do. And in many issues, what we have is, a, again, this layer that most of our roots are growing in is completely removed, leaving either a B horizon or a horizon where a lot of our um, nutrients and organic matter has kind of uh, moved out of. Another issue we have is a simple a lack of growing space, uh, which is not uncommon. This is, of course, maybe an extreme example. But again, if we think about how far our roots want to grow away from the tree, even if we think of our standard kind of home lots, a lot of times that is going to be the, the maximum space that a tree can grow is going to be limited by a lot of different infrastructure. And it's been found out that really to get big, healthy trees, you need a large volume of soil and you need a large volume of specifically healthy soil. So in a case like this, this is a pin oak, we have something that might want to get to be a hundred feet tall and live to be a couple hundred years old, but it's simply never going to recognize that because it's in a very, very small planting area. Another thing we run into a lot in our urban suburban environments, of course, is that we have competing vegetation, specifically turf grass. And turf grass is a very, it, it competes um, with trees for both water and nutrients and also has some allelopathic tendencies to where it can actually inhibit the growth of roots. And if we take a look real quick at this graphic, which has been made famous um, by Dr. Watson up there at the Morton Arboretum, this is just a quick example, again, of the amount of tree roots we have under turf. Because, again, turf uh, competes very well with tree roots. 
The other issues we have, of course, is we have a change in texture um, in many of our urban soils. And this affects the way water moves within our soil very often. So what people don't realize is that water does not like to move in between different textural classes. So for years, you know, in kindergarten, we have put stones in the bottom of styrofoam cups and then soil on top of that to plant um, our sunflowers in and watch them grow. And we were told we put those stones in there to help that soil drain, which is actually a fallacy because, again, water does not like to move through different textures. So if we have something like a fine textured soil on top of a coarse textured soil, that water is going to sit in that fine textured soil for a long time before it moves into that coarser textured soil. So this is what we call perched water table, which can be very, very um, detrimental, again, to roots that require air. Now this pore space is filled with water. On the flip side, again, if we have a very coarse textured soil on top of a very fine textured soil, once again, that water is going to sit there, again, filling up the macro pore space that our roots re require oxygen to be in. So this is where our process of root enhancement comes in. And this is a process by which what we're going to do is we're going to take our damaged urban soil that is low in organic matter and is, com is compacted. We're going to take our air spade and we're going to do air tilling here. So in the past, we would use a tiller, which of course could do a lot of damage to roots and sensitive things underground. We're going to use our air spade to essentially till the soil, air till the soil, break it up, and create a combination of both micro and macro um, pore spaces. So again, when we're doing this process, it's important to know we are not looking to pulverize soil. We're just looking to create, we're looking to break up the soil, break up that compaction, and create different size particles of soil. Because again, if you were to go out in the woods, you would notice that there are different size soil particles or soil peds in that soil. They're not all one grain, one size grain for the most part. And ideal soils. So after we've before we've done this, we're going to take a soil analysis. And after we have broken up our poor soil structure and created a, a better soil structure, we can add in what essential elements might be lacking in other amendments, which may be lacking to help this tree along its, in its new home or in its home. Part of this will also be we're going to be incorporating properly composted organic material because what, what this is going to do is this is going to keep our newly formed decompacted soil from recompacting. And especially if we have people out there that are working in heavy clay soils, if we don't amend our soil with composted, properly composted organic material, then that soil over time will recompact. And it can recompact really, really quickly, especially in our heavier clay soils. This is also a great time to apply some of our growth management tools, uh, specifically Canvastat, and we'll talk about some of the beneficial effects of that, and from there you get trees that are happy, that are growing um, very happily and very sustainably, because what we've done is we've just created a soil environment that they want to be in. As I mentioned, also this is a great time to put in other types of amendments, additional amendments to again try to improve the um, the soil around us. So in this case, uh, the Die Hard product root reviver comes with a mixture of mycorrhizae, uh, which are called mycorrhizal fungi, which will form that association and help trees to really exploit the soil around them. Um, different types of nitrogen-fixing bacteria, um, some bacteria that are going to be detrimental and antagonistic to soil pathogens, as well as some of these other things to provide additional micronutrients, soil wetting agents, and um, a humic acid, things like that, that are going to help our um, nutrient holding capacity. So again, we're going to create a soil that is that is ideal for plants to grow in, rather than just kind of putting a fix on it through fertilization um, or or other means. Now I mentioned Cambistat as a growth manager, and of course most of our growth managers or what we would call growth regulators, we think of as as ways to stop top growth, and they work very well as a management to stop top growth. But with our type 2 growth regulators, or what I like to call growth managers like Canvastat, it actually works as a hormone regulator. So it's regulating the hormone that's responsible for tip elongation, but it's increasing the hormone that's responsible for 
um, protecting cells from dehydration, um, helping the stomates to close faster. So as that leaf is beginning to run out of water, that stomate it will respond quicker so we don't get scorching. It also helps stimulate fine root growth. And on top of that, we have an increase in chlorophyll. So when we apply canvastat as a growth manager, um, as opposed to a growth regulator, what we see is, is we see an increase in chlorophyll, so we have greener leaves that can then um, create more food from the cells. Uh, we have an increased amount of, of root growth, so again, when we're talking about creating brand new soil, great soil for trees to grow in, we can encourage more root growth faster into that soil so they can get all the benefits of that new soil that we've created for them. Now again, let's look at a closer um, the, a close look at this process of root enhancement. So it begins with decompacting around the tree at a predetermined diameter around the tree. Ideally, we want to go out to the drip line and ideally pass the drip line, but we know that's not always viable for many reasons within our urban and suburban landscapes. So we want to have a predetermined uh, diameter around the trunk that we're going to decompact. And again, we want to break up that soil to between 8 and 12 inches um, with care not to create a perch water table by creating a one texture of soil. So we want different size soil particles so we're not creating that perch water table. And at this time, too, of course, we want to remove any excess soil away from the site. From there, what we're going to do is we're going to cover our newly decompacted area with two inches of what we call prescription organic matter. So this would be, again, this would be based upon our initial soil analysis, so we're getting exactly the types of elements and amendments into the tree that we feel are important to keep this new soil great, happy, healthy, and sustainable. And it's also really important to note that you want to get good organic material. You want to get properly organic, co properly composted organic material because if it's not fully composted, you're going to kind of mess with the carbon-nitrogen ratio in the soil, and you can actually tie up nitrogen in the soil because the microorganisms are going to be going after the non-composted parts of your organic material before they start releasing the nitrogen into the soil for the tree to use. So again, using good organic material is ideal. So next what we're going to do is we're going to use our air spade to mix that new organic material into the soil. So we're going to mix our two inches of organic material and amendments into the soil. Again, air till it in there and create this great new soil around the tree. We're going to water the soil at this point to saturation. After that, this is when we're going to want to apply our growth management tool like Canvastat to get the secondary health benefits of the hormone regulation with the Canvastat. At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to apply two to four inches of mulch. Again, one of the best things you can do for a tree is just mulch it correctly. So this is going to be part of our process. This will also keep the soil from drying out as fast in our brand new soil. So we're going to do a, a proper mulch application of two to four inches of mulch, and we're going to water that thoroughly. And once we have that watered thoroughly, and this is our final product, is we have an area around the tree that is, again, it's been amended according to a soil analysis, it's decompacted, it has organic matter incorporated around it, so you have this great soil that this tree can really take advantage of and do it in such in a way that's sustainable so we're not having to go through and put down a lot of additional products to keep this tree healthy. Um, again, there's research out there on this, you don't have to take my word for it, that shows um, great results with doing a process like this. Um, again, in a case like this, ideally what we want to do is we want to be able to affect as much soil volume as possible. So if we have several trees, we can link these together, which is a great opportunity. Um, again, I always tell people, you know, just we want soil volume, we want healthy soil volume. So try to concentrate too much on specifics when it comes to um, the, the dimensions of your, your area that you're doing root enhancement to, concentrate on as getting as much soil volume as you can because the tree will find ways to get roots to that area that you've improved and be able to get resources from, from it. Um, another option that we have here is whether it be due to the, the landscape or time or resources when it comes to, to money is we can do this, this key method. 
where in this case what we would do is we would do a, a ring that is three times the, the diameter of the tree, a radius around the trunk. This would be full uh, root enhancement. And then we would come out and put in these kind of key spokes or wheel spokes where we are doing full root enhancement here, full root enhancement here, full root enhancement here, and leaving these areas open. This is almost kind of a, a version of the old um, radial trenching method. Which again, that radial trenching method has been around for a long time. And, and in the past, what they, people would do is, again, they would use mechanical means, but we can still do something like a radial trenching method um, using the air spade. So again, we are not damaging these sensitive roots. We're just simply using air to expand the soil around these roots and really reducing the damage that can be caused to roots. And this is kind of um, the poster child, if you will, to um, a combination of radial trenching, root enhancement, and um, application of canvastat um, for its um, positive um, growth effects there. So here we have a tree that in 1989, this year is at the Morton Arboretum. In 1989, I think most of us would walk up to this tree and consider this tree a removal. Well, in this case, what they decided to do is do everything they can to save this tree, as an example. So the deadwood was pruned out. Radial trenching was uh, performed, and then an application of paclobutrazol or canvastat was applied. So that's now, five years after that treatment, this is what this tree looks like. And now we have applied canvastat to this tree uh, at intervals throughout its lifetime. So again, this is what it looked like in 1989, 1994, five years after treatment. Here we have 2001. And finally, 2014, we have these, this tree that we would have probably cut down in 1989. We have now this beautiful tree that is growing very nicely and in a sustained way um, still there with us. Real quick, and I know we're starting to run out of time here, so I want to be able to get through everything here with us. Um, but an idea of how to price this service. Again, this is one of the things that we get asked a lot is this sounds great. How do I sell it and how do I price it? So this is just a quick little example from our service company. Again, your prices are going to, you know, they're going to need to be adjusted for your market and your time and things like that. But we have some set prices on on our rings, so set square footage prices, and then they are tied into all the little things that go into this. So you know, if we have to remove any sod for this, um, sometimes what we'll do for really thick turf is we actually get a sod cutter to remove that sod there. Um, here, the price of the organic material, um, the price of and labor of the mulch spreading. And then we have these other things here, these what we call tree-specific charges. So if we suspect we're going to have a lot of stem girdling roots, uh, labor to do that. Uh, if we have a very, very compacted soil, again, if we're talking about these heavy clay soils, it's just going to simply take more time. So again, an estimate of labor charge there. I like this, the other things surcharge. I always like to think that the other things surcharge is when you're dealing with a client that's being a real pain in the, in the bottom, that you just charge them a little bit more. Uh, I think that's what it's for there. Uh, and then finally, again, pH adjustment surcharge. So all these little things that you can use to throw into your matrix so that you can, again, provide a great service to the health of the tree, as well as, you know, um, make sure it's profitable for you and, and your business. Because, of course, if we're not making money, then we can't do all these great things for trees. So root enhancement is a great process. Um, you know, it has a lot of positive benefits. But let's talk now real quick as we are going to wrap up our, our discussion here today is now that you have an air spade and you are, you're really good at doing stem girdling root uh, removal and, and root collar incubations and root enhancement, what else can you use this thing for? Well, there's a few other kind of neat little niches this tool has um, that you can incorporate again into your, your daily service and what I used to get a lot of calls about actually from some of my competitors, believe it or not, calling me in to do some of these things for them because they didn't have the tools or uh, ability to do it. But one thing is, again, is to actually find roots. Um, if we talk about the time it takes to dig trenches or dig around trees using common methods, 
If we use our airspeed, we can save a lot of time and labor. And also, I mean, when it comes to using a shovel and digging a trench versus using air to simply blow soil away, it is a lot easier on the body to use that air spade than it is to be down there with a pick and shovel to do it. So we find a lot of time savings um, using an air spade to dig trenches and find roots. And also it's just, it's simply easier on us actually doing it. So again, a great way to use this tool is to find roots. So if we are doing some kind of infrastructure improvement, we can find where those roots are, and this will allow us to do clean cutting of the roots if that's appropriate. It allows us to do selective pruning of roots if that's appropriate. And in some cases, though they're not many, but some that I have been part of, it's allowed us to actually move the infrastructure away from the tree, which of course has so many benefits for the tree outside of just the root loss there. So it actually move find the roots to move infrastructure around the tree. Some other examples, now this of course is a quite an extreme example, but in this case the air spade was used so that they could put in a new drainage pipe without removing tree roots. Um, I don't know if you guys read the last, uh, last uh, edition of Arborist News, but there was a, an article in there talking about um, the process of coded, and one of the re recommendations in there was not to prune roots greater than one inch in diameter. Um, so here again, we were able to save a lot of these structural roots. Of course, we lost a lot of fine roots, but we saved a lot of structural roots, and now we're going to be able to get more fine roots growing off the structural roots here, in this case, instead of just having one traumatic, completely traumatic event to this tree. Another example here, um, in this case, we use the air spade, or someone used the air spade, to trench around this tree so that we can get buried electrical lines into this new development. So again, in the past, we would have had two options. One is they would have cut this tree down because we would have created a hazard by cutting these roots so close to the tree, and or they probably wouldn't have even consulted with an arborist, and they would have trenched these roots with something like a trencher, removed a lot of structural roots, and then we would have a tree that would be considered a hazard. So again, just another neat little service that you can add in there to really help trees and kind of, again, build relationships with um, builders and construction companies, which then of course would probably be refer you more work um, and some of your other services, especially with uh, construction remediation and pruning and things like that. Another handy thing to use this for is in your stump grinding applications. So, you know, in this case here, you know, imagine going out and being told to surface grind the stump or asked to surface grind the stump with all of these utilities under here. Now we know things like this yellow, which probably represent gas lines, we know it's supposed to be pretty deep down there. But we also know if we have done a lot of stump grinding or digging the soil that things are not always where they're supposed to be. So now using the air spade, we can actually blow out around where these lines are marked, find these lines, and now we can feel a lot more comfortable about doing a surface grind here in this case on this stump versus just going in there blindly and hoping that our our utility markers are right. Um, I've been on several properties where you know the utility was marked, but the utility was probably a good six feet away from that thing was marked. So again, to be doubly safe and provide just extra service to our clients. This can also be used to find things that again are unmarked and may not be required to be marked and or marked by our homeowner and they really don't have a good idea of where their actual utility is, and what I'm thinking about here, of course, is, is irrigation lines. Um, I, you know, I wish we could have a show of hands here, but who's gone out with their stump grinder and hit an irrigation line that wasn't marked or out of line with the rest of the irrigation system and ended up with something like this, where you're flooding out a part of the yard and you have water bubbling up at you um, just because all you're trying to do is grind stump. So again, if you have uh, situations where you're or, afraid of hitting irrigation, your client is sensitive to that, uh, and of course this is something else you can charge, this is an additional charge, of course, that you could bring to your client, um, so that you can say, hey, we're going to be doubly sure we're not going to hit irrigation, we're going to find it, um, and then we're going to grind your stump. So just another quick, neat little service that you can add um, using the air spade. Um, another one, too, that we've found that has worked for some clients is actually preparing these planting beds. Or again, in the past, to prepare a planting bed, you'd be going out there with a mechanical tiller. Um, if you're close to a tree, 
or another sensitive area, again, you run the risk of, of doing some collateral damage. But this works very well to prepare planting beds. And this can be a service, especially for some of your clients that you have great relationships with, and you're out there often going out there and just helping them out with one more service now that you have this tool. And actually, they recently just came out with what they call the shrub gun, which this is kind of a, you can see here, it's a short barreled air spade. And instead of having a, a 150 um, CFM nozzle, it has a 60 CFM nozzle. And this is, was specifically designed for doing things like this and for doing things around shrubs where having, you know, a shorter handle combined with, you know, not the full 150 to 225 um, cubic feet per minute nozzle has is uh, is very beneficial for it, for those types of practices. So something new out there. Another thing that I personally use the airspace for too is bare rooting trees to move them. Um, we've had cases where again um, our clients wanted us to move trees, and, and the situation that that I was involved in is we had a tree on a slope, uh, which getting equipment to was going to be a real real pain. Um, and a, a danger really to do. So we just went out there with our air spade. We, uh, we bare rooted the tree. This, in this case, it was a loblolly pine tree of all things. Bare rooted the tree, moved it to another set of the yard, and that tree is still there and growing. So it's another option that you can use your air spade for, another service you can bring to your clients. So in some nation, um, you know, how can the air spade help me grow and how can you bring this to your clients, to your service, your your um, your plant healthcare toolbox immediately. Well, you know, again, it's it's don't try to go out there and start doing everything with it. Market um, just a few services at a time. Again, you know, the root collar excavation and stem girdling roots are something you can go out and start doing right away. Um, and again, coming into fall, that's a great fall service as we discussed. So doing root collar excavations or moving stem girdling roots or something that you can start marketing now and start scheduling in the months to come. Um, just a quick, another real real world example in 2009. So in 2009, we had the airspace, we're probably um, at this uh, close to 10, nine to 10 years at this point. Uh, and of course it grew. So in 2009, it was proposed on 659 properties and accepted 431 times. So that's 65% closing ratio on this. And again, we're looking at, you know, again, in our market up there in the Twin Cities, we're looking for a $300 um, minimum charge. So again, adjust that for your market and your clients, but you know that's uh, that's a significant kind of bonus chunk of change there to our um, to our operations. So real quick, we have a few other webinars that I'd really encourage you to, to uh, sign up for if you enjoyed this one or any of our other ones. Um, we have one coming up on the 29th about um, soil management. Um, you can listen to me again on the 30th, talk about leaf chlorosis, and our final one for the fall season is going to be on August 12th, where we'll talk about late season insect management. Um, our Saluting Branches campaign, this is a volunteer event coming up 20, on September 23rd, where we're going to go out to 22 veteran cemeteries across the country, and we're going to offer a day of service, so a day of tree work to our veteran cemeteries that are in much need of care. So deadwood removal, any large removals that need to be done for safety reasons. You can go to salutingbranches.org. You can find the cemetery closest to you. We're really looking for volunteers. We have some cemeteries. We're really needing some more volunteers. So again, go to that salutingbranches.org and sign up. It's going to be a really fun day. We're going to do a really good thing. Um, that will conclude our talk. If there are any questions, um, please feel free to type that into the question box. Again, over there on the right-hand side of your screen, we have a little um, arrow there. You can expand that. You will see something that says questions. You can click on that, and you can type into that field if you have any questions um, here based upon our, our talk today. Um, and with that, again, please, this is my information. If any questions at any time, please feel free to contact me. Visit our website where you can learn more about our products and protocols. And again, our solution center, which is available um, during business hours throughout the country. Uh, questions on uh, dosing, products, protocols, diagnosis, things like that. You can call that number at any time and actually talk to a real life person. 
So with that, I will uh, I'll hang out here for a few moments to see if we have any questions coming in right now. We're we're quiet on the the question front, which is fine. All right. So we don't have any questions. That's great. We'll wrap up again. Thank you guys so much for attending today. And we look forward to seeing you at a future event or webinar in the future. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.